Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. We're very excited to have our Executive Director, Tom Addis, and our Chief Membership Officer, Jeff Johnson, and CFO as well, on the Catalyst this morning. They're going to be taking us through a look back at the last 50 years of the SCPGA. Good morning, TA. Good morning, Jeff. How are you today? Morning. Thank you very much. Pleasure we also to have an Executive Committee member for the SCPGA, Mr. Eric Lohman, on who is going to be facilitating the webinar this morning with Q&A uh, to take us through those 50 years. Thank you, Eric, for being on. Can you hear us? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we good to start? Absolutely. Take it away. Well, excellent. I think there's a couple other folks that we want to recognize that are going to be a part of today's uh, presentation. Obviously, we have past president Skip Wittick, who's with us. Skip, thanks for joining us this morning. We can't wait for you to jump in and answer some questions and uh, provide some dialogue and some feedback based on your history of the Southern California PGA. You know My what? Uh, good morning, Skip. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And we also have a uh, guest appearance uh, from Tom Sargent, uh, who will be uh, sharing some of his uh, feedback via video, uh, which we'll be sharing here in a few moments. So all in all, we have a great uh, group of uh, leaders and uh, Obviously, former a lot of former presidents, it looks like, of the Southern California PGA, so we thank you for that. Uh, just to kind of set the framework, uh, we were all talking a few months ago about some great uh, uh, ways for us to showcase and talk about the history of the Southern California PGA, and uh, that's where Tom and I came up with this idea, and we're very excited to learn a little bit about the last 50 years or so of the Southern California PGA, and... Um, the last 50 years have been pretty uh, dramatic with some highs and some lows, and uh, it certainly has created uh, where we are today or helped uh, frame where we are today, which is one of the most robust and dynamic sections in the country. And uh, with that being said, Tom, I would just love for you to uh, start and give us sort of a snapshot. You and I talked about how uh, you could probably take a look at the section and break it into two parts, kind of like a pre-1970s, mid-70s, and a post-1970s. Why don't you Give us a little update of what maybe would have uh, transpired before then and what were the key triggers that uh, kind of frame us as we are today. Yeah, great, Eric. Thanks. And I'd also like to uh, uh, welcome Nikki Gatch, our assistant ED, is with us, and she'll come in uh, with Mr. Sargent a little bit later on uh, for junior golf. And then we have our president, Tony Latendre, with us. So, uh, yeah, the, the section really in the uh, late 60s, uh, early 70s was more uh, in tune with um, uh, membership issues and uh, really uh, uh, member events, member tournaments in particular. And our section was known uh, possibly throughout the 70s uh, as really a, a very, very busy tournament uh, production or operations section. And uh, within that decade, uh, a number of events were started, and, and of course, Skip was president. Uh, not many people remember this because it's so far back. Um, but I think somewhere in the mid 70s, right, Skip? Yeah, 78, 79. Yeah, and uh, excuse me, late 70s. And uh, as as most people know, as I started to mention, that most of our activities were related to tournaments. And a couple things, uh, and and we'll move on. That happened back in that time frame and skip chime in if, if you'd like uh, we started what was called the western states uh, apprentice and assistance championship uh, started in sacramento uh, went down to san diego for a while at singing hills then went up to uh, lake tahoe ended up in las vegas and uh, really that was the precursor to the national uh, pga of america assistance championship uh, and that event was started by dick geckner uh, uh, some people might remember Dick, uh, and Ron O'Connor, who a lot of people don't know, uh, was our executive director, <clears throat> excuse me, from the late 70s into the mid 80s, uh, and Ron still serves as chair of our rules committee, so those of you who know Ron uh, might not have known that. So uh, as we move through the 70s, uh, 
our, our programs increased. We moved the offices. We we were first uh, with the Southern California Golf Association, as a matter of fact, uh, where their offices uh, are still located on Cahuenga Boulevard in North Hollywood. And uh, uh, following that, we moved into Anaheim, uh, and then following that into Brea prior to moving out into Beaumont. So. Uh, we had a little bit of movement uh, as the section grew, and we needed more staff, whether it was member services, uh, whether it was tournaments, and as we'll find out later on, uh, junior golf. With, um, and I appreciate that, with uh, obviously in the late 70s, uh, with when Skip was president, and, and I believe Ron was the ED, the section elected to start its own golf show. Uh, which is uh, obviously a, a big catalyst uh, to steal a word from what we're doing is a big catalyst to some of the things that we're able to do today. Skip, maybe uh, talk a little bit about what was the thinking or the reasoning behind that and and uh, give us sort of an overview of the first few years of what happened there. Okay. Uh, I can remember uh, playing in a golf tournament. I think we were at Wilshire Country Club. And it was Howard Smith, Dick Gecker, and I were having a an adult beverage after play and we got talking about the merchandise show in florida in january and how it didn't affect us here on the west coast because we were already uh, that was our christmas was coming up we had nothing to do so howard and i and dick and i thought we ought to have our own merchandise show so we started with uh, a, uh renting about i believe a dozen rooms at the pacifica hotel down by by the airport and we alerted the the western sections uh the mid southwest uh, through nevada washington oregon all those that come in uh to join us if they'd be interested in the show and after we got returns from them they said yes they'd be interested then we went to the suppliers and the manufacturers and they all came aboard i think we had 12 rooms with manufacturers who were there for a couple of days and uh it turned out to be a pretty good thing and tom i can't remember where we went from there I, I think we went to Long Beach after that mission I show. We actually went, we actually, Skip, thanks. We had uh, we had a conference in 79 at Industry Hills. Industry Hills, that's right. And it, we called it the West Coast uh, Merchandise Conference and invited the Western sections to discuss whether we should do a Western, expand what we'd already done. And as, and as uh, Skip mentioned at the Pacifica, uh, expand what we were into uh, and expand the show to include many of the Western states. Uh, and that's where the West Coast International um, Merchandise Show was born. Uh, and we opened the show in 1980. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, PJ of America, then uh, uh, Vice President, I believe he was, Joe Black came out and, uh, and opened the show. We were in the parking garage, uh, Skip, you might remember this, at Industry Hills. Yes, I do. And it was 108 degrees. That's right. <laughs> Uh, uh, the outdoor carpet on the floor on the on the parking lot, and uh, Roger Ballinger was the director of golf there and helped us to acquire that. And uh, we had a huge fan at one end of the entrance, I remember, and uh, we had a pretty good show. It actually turned out to be a pretty good deal. But uh, from there, uh, it it was uh, we we lost our fanny, I think, on that first show. But you know, it was a step go forward so we could better ourselves and make it better for the West Coast play players. Yeah, we did two years there, and then we decided we should get out of the garage. Uh, primarily the fans, you couldn't hear yourself. Plus, if you walked in front of them, you'd end up in the other end of the hall. Uh, and uh, uh, But anyway, we moved to San Diego uh, for a year. Uh, and then following San Diego, we ended up in Long Beach, uh, Anaheim for a year, uh, and then Las Vegas following that. Yeah, I can remember uh, how the manufacturers all decided that this was the best thing for the West Coast players. And it turned out, as we found out, it turned out to be the right move for all of us. What year and which show did you guys, what, did it like reach its pinnacle of participation? When did it really take off and become something of noteworthy? Probably Las Vegas when the show moved. Long Beach was good. Long Beach was very successful. Right. And then when it moved to Las Vegas, uh, was even a little bit more successful in numbers. That is, uh, we kept promoting into the Western states, and and uh, I know that Texas had a show, uh, as did the Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest still has their show. 
uh, and uh, and promoted with all three of those shows to try to uh, and and schedule away from them so we could uh, we could use the schedule where somebody wanted to go to Texas, somebody wanted to go to to Seattle, somebody wanted to come to Southern California, uh, and that seemed to work for a while. Was the show as it was a uh, as it was laid out and, and ran? Was it a consumer show or is it just a supplier vendor supplier show? It, it was total trade show, yeah. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, and I know Jeff might have been involved with this, and, and Skip as well. Uh, later on, we had a uh, we did a, a show with the SCGA that was a consumer show. Now within the West Coast show, uh, and, and I think you, Skip, you and Andy handled this, if I if I recall. Uh, we had a golf shop inside the uh, the West Coast show, I, and I can't recall. I believe the last couple of years we did it in Southern California in Long Beach, that consumers could come in and and, and purchase goods from the various golf shops uh, around Southern California if they decided to exhibit at, at our West Coast show. Yeah, we asked the, the professionals that, that own their own shops if they wanted to bring merchandise into their booth and they could sell there. And that was, uh, I'm not sure how successful it was, but I know it was it was a new way to get the outside people into our show rather than just our own professionals. So it worked out to be pretty well. So guys, this is not the Las Vegas show that we would know from the last 10 or 15 years. But our show, when it was acquired by the PGA, uh, transitioned Ooh. to the Las Vegas show, yes. So you, you could say it's one and the same, but with the PGA, when the PGA came in, uh, much more expanded. So just so that everyone knows, so the, the section elected to start a, a show, which <clears throat> uh, struggled at the beginning, then gained some popularity, moved around a little bit, and eventually found its way uh, out to Las Vegas. And then at what point, uh, or how did it come about that the section was approached to potentially sell that asset? And on the on the other side, how, I mean, technically, how does the section own a show that's in Las Vegas? How do you own an entity like that that's worth something to be sold? Yeah, I'll I'll start that. I know Jeff was involved in the uh, in the original negotiations, or at least the start of them with, uh, or maybe the final. Uh, but Jeff has some input, and then uh, Tom Sargent. We have some. Uh, uh, video of Tom who will cover uh, the start of the sale of the show uh, in kind of an entertaining way. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, but uh, we uh, we had thought that with the success of the show uh, and particularly in Las Vegas, uh, and that was really in our conversations was one of the original ideas was hopefully we could sell the show. Uh, to the PGA of America. That was one of the founding ideas uh, behind the establishment. Uh, Skip, I, I assume you recall that, uh, that that was one of the goals we had uh, uh, for the future. Well, when the National called us and said they wanted to be involved because it was disturbing their show in January, and, I, and from then on, I think Tom Sargent was more influential in that conversation. I wasn't there. The, um, um, we had approval at that time from the PGA, Eric, to get more back into your question as well. Uh, and we had the agreement with the PGA of America that we could do a show. Uh, and so we were under that agreement with the PGA until we sold to the PGA. I think that's a nice transition for us to maybe play uh, Mr. Sargent's video about the PGA show. I believe the first one was in 1980. They started doing it, working on it in 79. Uh, but I came to it about, I think it was 81 when I began to.
until uh, we sent George and Tom Gustafson out to uh, have evaluation done by an independent. So, But uh, still, it was two to two. Pretty, uh, pretty spectacular, if you ask me. For a uh, an effort to be a little bit more uh, 
accommodating to our fellow golf professionals in Southern California and the Western United States. We create a, a golf show that travels around, eventually makes its way to uh, Las Vegas and gets some exposure to the National PGA. We end up selling it and netting $22 million, which is today the framework for the section um, investment fund and, and actually uh, was the spring load for a lot of great achievement that the section has had for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, I don't know if there's any more comments at all in regards to the uh, show, Skip or Tom? No, I just know that uh, when we started that at the Pacific Hotel, I had no idea we were going to be $10 million uh, or even higher than that. That was something that uh, I'm unfortunate that Howard Smith and Dick Ector both passed and didn't see that thing happen to, to the section, but uh, I have to thank them both for their work. And Tom, Tom was part of that also, and Tom Sargent. Uh, there was a lot of people in the back, Ryan Lake. Uh, there were some people there that uh, were part of that situation. Tommy Barber, uh, Bob Harrison. I mean, go back to those guys. They were all part of that organization then. And uh, uh, it, it, it were tr actually turned out to be the best thing we could ever do. So I'm very pleased to be a part of it. Skip, yes, and, um, what year? Uh, what year did that take place? That uh, that final sale to the to national. I'm sorry, that was me. Yeah, Tom. Uh, or Skip, or whoever knows. What, yeah, what year did that did that actually happen? And, and Jeff was involved in that too, as well. Yeah. Uh, as Tom mentioned, it was the conversation started in '91, and and uh, and then consummated and entered around 98 when uh, the PGA sold uh, the show to Reed Expositions, uh, who currently owns uh, the rights to the Las Vegas show. Uh, and then uh, after that, which we'll talk about when we talk about the golf course, uh, that's where we move forward from there. Perfect. Um, transitioning uh, topics, obviously, uh, junior golf is a big thing that the Southern California PGA uh, manages for all the young golfers in Southern California, and um, I didn't always manage that, and there was a transition of sorts that took place. Tom, you want to talk a little bit about how we became more involved with junior golf, and I know that we also have another uh, video from Tom Sargent to give his background, as he was also very instrumental in that as well. Yeah, Tom's video pretty much covers the the transition from when uh, the Southern California PGA took over uh, what was then the Southern California Junior Golf Association with Ralph Miller and Bill Bryant uh, and Lou Bastinchuri, uh, a couple of our PGA professionals headed by Joe Robinson and the like. So I, I think Tom's video explains it very, very well. We could go into that. Bryce, if you don't mind, let's cue up uh, Tom's uh, second video. And then we can follow up with Nikki as well.
over 500 uh, members. And all of a sudden, uh, we needed to have tournaments. So it was.
Well, that's a pretty interesting history there. Um, and I got a few questions for uh, Miss Gatch, who will uh, Mrs. Gatch will pick up here in a second. But uh, a couple things. One, um, you know, when I started playing junior golf in Southern California, it was in 1984 or five when I started playing those tours. And it would have been right around that time that the uh, that the junior golf program transitioned. And obviously, at my age, I wasn't paying much attention to that. I think uh, for the longest time, I got confused of who really was the governing body. Um, but being out from the desert and, and playing some golf with Nikki Gatch growing up, um, I definitely can remember her influence after that. And uh, Nikki. Tell us a little bit about, uh, obviously, uh, Sarge and, and that group was real instrumental in transitioning. How about a few years after that transition, what did you witness? And uh, tell us a few stories there, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And, and good good times, for sure, back back in uh, our junior golf days, Eric, with you and your brother, Chris. Um, you know, to hear, to hear that history and tradition that we have, not only with our section, but how uh, junior golf has evolved is, it's, you know, I've heard the story many times, but it's always great to, to hear it again and really kind of puts things in perspective of where we were and, and you know, how far we've come and where we are today with, you know, 3,000 kids and all the programs that we do uh, specific to junior golf and, and certainly under our foundation as well with outreach programs and uh, really trying to introduce the, the game to as many people as possible. Um, you know, Sarge is is wonderful. I mean, it, it's no secret he's so passionate about this, and we've been fortunate that he's been involved, uh, you know, over 30 years now. He still serves as our junior golf chairman and um, probably will for forever. Um, so, you know, it's it's just great under his leadership to see what we've done, what we've been able to accomplish. Um, you know, even when I, I came on board in 98, I believe it was, um, overseeing the, the desert program, which at that time was Desert Junior Golf Association, and then you know, came under the umbrella of of the section. You know, we we were a traditional junior golf association playing in the summer, um, and then to see how that sort of evolved as um, as the demand was there, as as the game was growing and more kids were getting introduced to the game, and you know, really taking advantage of where we live and being able to play year round, and starting to introduce more tournaments in the in the spring and the fall, and um, now we're we're going you know year round. We basically take uh, you know a few weeks in January off to sort of reboot, um, but offering something you know year round um, to see how our team has grown. I mean, we have a full staff of six people that manage this tour. Uh, we have about 30 uh, part-time field staff that help us uh, administer these events. I mean, we'll, we'll sometimes have you know four or five, six, seven events on a weekend, uh, as an example. So. You know, great, great exposure to our, our section facilities and, and our PJ professionals, and it's just amazing to, to watch it grow. And, you know, we've hit a little bit of a bump with, with COVID this year and, and our participation and membership and, and having to cancel and reschedule events. But, you know, really looking forward to, to get back, uh, you know, full board ahead and, and try somehow to get to the, the, the 500, 5,000 mark that, that Sarge referred to. The... Um... Yeah, that's a pretty, and a pretty <laughs> crazy accomplishments that everybody has made. And just think about the last 50 years or so of junior golf in Southern California and the, the number of quality, not only the number of players, the people like us that have just participated, but think about the quality of the, the PGA Tour, the LPGA Tour, and now you see an influx of those folks playing now on the senior tour, both men and women. It's, it's been a pretty, you know, crazy run and even with the likes of, you know, Morikawa and, and some of the new up-and-coming young ladies that I know have had some great success, uh, the future is very bright, and the quality of golf that we have in Southern California, the juniors, and the events that we have, which keep them here and make them competitive, is, is pretty fantastic. And as a testament to Tom and you and, and everyone else, uh, you know, both Sergeant and Status, the, you know, the folks that uh, – For the sake of time, we're going to transition again. Um, so obviously, we we started the show and we're getting in the process of selling the show and making twenty something million dollars, and we've got a robust junior golf program that's running across the country. 
uh, why don't uh, Tom and Jeff, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what was the, uh, the, the decision, the timing and the decisions that were made and talk a little bit about the PGA club, how we came about that and kind of give us the full bell curve of the idea, the creation, and then the sell. Yeah, Jeff was in on the, the, as the old saying goes, the ground floor. And, and once we sold the show and had, and had the funds available and, and to make the decision as to what best to do, uh, uh, Jeff was right there from the very beginning and, uh, uh, and Jeff Johnson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Eric. Thanks, Tom. I, I think one of the things that um, is important to note is that we had always wanted a home site for not only our headquarters, but for our Hall of Fame um, and to do education as well as um, a home site for championship golf. And it was around 1996 um, that uh, Ernie Vossler and Joe Walser came to us uh, with the idea. Uh, they were part of a group called the Oak Valley Partners. And of course, you know them as the landmark golf company. Uh, but had a vested interest in uh, Oak Valley, 7,500 acres. Um, and they provided us um, with arguably what became pretty expensive free land, uh, but, but they gave us 500 acres to develop 36 holes of golf. Um, and we interviewed uh, a few architects, uh, did some routings with uh, Mr. Fazio and Mr. Dye, and settled on... Um, uh, Lee Schmidt and Brian Curley uh, to do the routing and uh, manage the construction uh, of the 36 holes. And it, it was a grand time um, out, out on that uh, 500 acres and uh, made some real special uh, memories with uh, some great golf holes and uh, a lot of tournaments and a lot of players. The very first year in operation, uh, we played 102,000 rounds did six million dollars in revenue and had a net operating income of a little over a million dollars um, and at that point we were working in beautiful modular buildings uh, for food and beverage as well as the golf operation uh, as well as a big borga building uh, on what is now the east side of the parking lot uh, where we housed our 200 golf cars and everything was just moving along famously um, and there came a moment when I'd gone to the Oak Valley Partners. At the time, it was uh, um, uh, Andy Vossler um, in, in charge of the group out there and told them that we would be unable to build a permanent clubhouse, that we simply couldn't afford to do so at this time. And that began uh, a bit of a crisis, if you will. Um, they insisted that the modular buildings were not a clubhouse and I continued to insist that they were. So one thing led to another and they revised the contract to more clearly specify a permanent clubhouse and at that time uh, Ernie and Joe came and met with uh, Tom Gustafson and I and uh, Tom executed a new agreement uh, that was full of penalties if we hadn't met certain time frames for the golf course free and clear it was making money I still had plenty of money in the bank and because of that revised contract um, we were then forced to spend 7.3 million dollars taking out a loan with Textron uh, to build a permanent clubhouse and it was that expenditure that uh, one might uh, say has, has caused the, the demise of the club uh, a few years later <laughs> The, um, you know, at what point or what year did, did, did uh, everybody start thinking that maybe it just wasn't going to work out and they needed to pull, pull the plug and make a different decision? Well, it, it was continually after 2003 losing money uh, and it got very thin. And at that point, um, we were looking to make a sale. Uh, Patrick Casey was very instrumental uh, in facilitating that. Um, uh, we sold the club to Chun Man Lee, um, an investor who loved golf, and uh, sadly it didn't work out for him either. Um, and he subsequently sold it to the uh, Morongo Band of um, uh, Indians. 
it, uh, if you had to pick a, a, a root cause of the the I guess you could say the lack of success there would it be that we were required to build a, a clubhouse that just wasn't feasible and it wasn't going to ever kind of pay back its you know exorbitant cost and that was the catalyst or was it more so like a change in the environment of the players and, and the consumers who just weren't coming out to that area as much as we'd all hoped for at the beginning? Yeah, I, I'd say there are probably a couple factors, uh, Eric. The first is that the real estate development that we were promised that would surround this golf course and provide a multitude of memberships was five years late. Uh, nothing was built. The golf course opened, uh, everything was fine, and it was just bare land for the next five years because uh, of all of the problems that were taking place in the real estate market. Um, the clubhouse was an absolute drain because we had a debt ratio coverage to meet with Textron, uh, which was onerous and, and crippling. So I would say the combination of uh, a development being five years late and uh, taking on debt that we, uh, again, in my opinion, absolutely shouldn't have um, were the circumstances that, that created a move in the wrong direction. And when we sold the golf course, we still owed $8 million uh, based on rollovers and based on additional interest and the like from the original. What was it, Jeff? You said $7.3 million yeah. loan? That was the clubhouse. And there, yeah. there were other things, you know, yeah. Eric and, and Tom, that uh, when I, I joke about it being expensive free land, it was. We had to relocate uh, an entryway that cost almost a half a million dollars. We had to do a drainage channel through San Timoteo Canyon uh, that no one had told us or uh, expressed any um, concern about until all of a sudden the county of Riverside said, you must do this. And then there's the infamous uh, California coastal gnat catcher that stopped construction um, and rerouted on the Champions Golf Course holes 14, 15, and 16. Uh, all had to be moved, slowed us down for almost five months, and that cost a quarter of a million dollars. So there there were issues in the construction, but again, at the end of it all, we had a golf course that was completely paid for. Um, and as Tom says, when we finally were able to sell the golf course to Mr. Lee, um, there was still an $8 million obligation, uh, primarily because of the clubhouse itself and the money we owed. And fortunately, we sold... We, we closed the sale in December of 07, and, and thanks to Patrick Casey and and the officers, the executive committee, and the board at that time that the foresight uh, there was to sell the, the, the property at that time. And of course, everybody knows what happened in 2008, uh, just a couple of months after we sold the golf course. Uh, and then we were able to convert that. We invested that $8 million uh, and convert that into our current investment program that's allowed us to buy this building and uh, and and create uh, many, many more member service programs, whether it be free uh, meetings, uh, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and, uh, and thank goodness we were able to sell the golf course at that time. Yeah, I mean, the history is, is uh, pretty interesting when you think about it. We were su super lucky with the PGA show we felt like we made a, a good, smart decision in regards to the development. Unfortunately, as most of us or any of us have been involved with those types of projects, they just never really ever kind of work out the way you want them to. I've been involved with several that uh, were kind of contingent on the timing of certain things and whether it's local communities or timeshares or things that would help support a resort. So it would help support a property when you, when you have to kind of stand alone in a in a in a not quite a high peak or high volume area it can be very difficult then then we you know we've made the toughest decision probably that a lot of you had to make which was to you know take the loss and and get out and then we were hor you know horribly lucky to get somebody to buy it at, at still a pretty high valuation if you think about what we were able to sell that for you know fast forward two or three years that valuation would have been i don't know what 33 cents on the dollar or something less and and, and uh, because of that we were then able to transition a, again a, a fairly significant amount of money that can be traced all the way back to the sell of the show uh, to our investment fund which is now one of the uh, 
great assets of our association, which helps us uh, continue to uh, feed our foundation and some of our outreach programs. Can you talk maybe a little bit, uh, Tom, Jeff, and even Nikki, in regards to the foundation and sort of where and how that came about and the timing of that and sort of where we are today and what we're looking forward to in the future? Well, that'll be Nikki's uh, little bit of a Bailey. Yeah, welcome back to the show. Okay, hi. Um, so I believe our foundation was was officially started um, in 1997, if I believe. At, uh, Sarge mentioned Frank Tallarico. I know he was hired shortly after that as our first foundation director. Um, you know, at that time it was really, uh, sorry, Eric. <laughs> um, at that time, you know, really our focus was on on junior golf solely, and it's been nice to see how we've transitioned. Um, over the last you know 20 plus years with our foundation and, and certainly junior golf continues to be uh, the core and what we focus on in our foundation but but also much more you know outreach and inclusion opportunities uh, the program we're doing in Compton as an example um, exposing the game to as to as many people as possible um, our clubs for youth program scholarships grants um, you know we we gave away a quarter of a million dollars in scholarships this year, which was a milestone for us. Um, starting fundraising efforts, um, you know, to be able to, to do all of these things. Um, our foundation is led now by Matt Gilson uh, for the last few years, and he's done a, done a great job. And so he works in unison with Kevin Smith, our junior golf director and Kevin's team. Um, and then certainly with um, Eddie Rodarte, who's in junior golf, but. Um, as well has responsibilities for our um, outreach and inclusion efforts, and then Anthony Leone with our player development efforts. So we really have assembled this great team um, to do all these wonderful things to, again, uh, expose the game to as many people as possible, certainly focusing on youth, um, but really trying to just, you know, grow the game in, in any way that we can. That's uh that's a great story, and obviously, you know, Matt and the and the is done done doing a wonderful job, and obviously Frank Tallarico, Tallarico laid the groundwork. And when I became, uh, you know, that's Frank was in charge of that when I joined our section and, and became a member in 2000, and uh, remember Frank's involvement and participation. And you know, he just left us uh, where he was president of our foundation. And uh, just left to become the executive director of the uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, P, or the P, the, sorry, the PGA Pacific Northwest PGA section. Okay. And uh, so they're very fortunate to have Frank up there, and with his wealth of knowledge and and his history and background, I'm sure he'll lead them in the right direction. Uh, also, I think it's a, a testament and, and something that we should be very thankful for is we have, I think, with maybe one of our first big events for the foundation. The golf tournament, which will be held this weekend, Sunday and Monday, out uh, at Rams Hill, and it's a sellout. And uh, yes. and uh, so I think that's just another sign of good things to come and continuing the momentum uh, that you all have established. So congratulations to Matt, and obviously thanks to Frank and to you for all that you've done over the last 10, 15 years in regards to the foundation. But I do know that the clubs for youth and some of our other outreach programs and Obviously, the scholarships are making an immense uh, impact, and uh, we also have other great things like uh, the thing that we're doing in um, Compton with their uh, high school programs and their golf course there is, is pretty special. And again, as you trace the history, uh, you know, we're pushing it forward and we're making a difference, and um, you know, we're, we're making steps on top of the shoulders of those who come before us, which is pretty pretty important and pretty special. So. Um, Tom or Jeff, maybe Jeff, you want to just give a maybe a brief rundown of the investment fund and kind of where that is and where that's going. Yeah, it's it's going well um, actually. Uh, as Tom had mentioned, we began that fund with eight million dollars. Um, it currently sits at a little over eleven million dollars, and it's uh, allowed us to take a draw for section and section programs annually. Um, so all in the eight million because of the building we own and all of the FF and E in the building plus the value of the fund, uh, eight million has become about sixteen and a half million dollars. So uh, it, it's a remarkable story. Uh, we have sixty percent of uh, our investments are in equities, thirty percent in fixed income, 
uh, and 10% in, in leveraged hedge fund type investments and uh, uh, very well diversified of that 60% in equities, 45% uh, is domestic and 15% is international. And um, we've just seen extraordinary gains, all managed by Canterbury. Um, they've been with us now for 11 years and um, they've just done heroes work on our behalf. Well, that's, uh, that's a pretty great story. And, and it's, uh, I mean, if you look at the, uh, again, the financials, the finances of the section, it's been kind of like a roller coaster and I think we're all challenged to make sure we don't go back down this way. We only can go upwards at this point. Yeah, well, and that's where the, you know, the whole point of being so well diversified is really played in our favor. Um, you know, there are those moments when you're nervous and you think everything should be in cash, um, but we get talked off that ledge very quickly by the professionals that are managing uh, our resources. And um, it, it's just been a great run and no doubt that it will continue to be. And just real briefly, uh, inurnment is a big topic that we all have, obviously, just for the folks that are on the call or are going to watch us in future years. That investment fund is not something that we can just uh, pull money out of and add to a purse or give by Skip a, a sailboat so that he can go around his country club's lakes searching for carp. Um, no, no. We're kind of restricted and therefore we only pull out so much money each year and then those monies are allocated towards certain um, aspects of our operation. Can you briefly touch on that? Sure. You know, other than the boat we were going to buy for Skip, um, <laughs> I think that, you know, what we do is we draw 4% um, uh, of that fund annually. Uh, and we base that 4% on a trailing three years performance. Uh, and the funds that we draw support section programs, uh, education, chapters, uh, and, and a variety of things. And to your point about the word inurement, uh, because the section is a 501c6, which is uh, an entity that um, is not for profit, uh, we are not allowed to inure or enrich an individual member uh, by using those funds. It would violate our tax-exempt status. Um, and that's the long and short of it. The corporation that conducts all of our competitions, whether they be seniors or women or section events uh, and chapter events, uh, is a for-profit corporation. So everything that we raise there through partner relationships and entry fees is paid right back to the contestants. Uh, but that wouldn't be possible uh, under the C6, which is the section. And if, if I'm not mistaken, this is not dissimilar to the National Association and the fund that they have, that they've created through the Ryder Cup and through the PGA Championship. That's they correct. They do have a large fund that is uh, treated somewhat similarly the, as we treat ours and there's questions that come up as well in, in regards to inurnment and how can they not pass that money back to us as well yeah well they can't and, and they've got a great deal of it um, you know they are a c6 as well um, and and, and I, I think the takeaway here is that you know we're always struggling a little bit to understand what you can and can't do with 130 million dollars in reserves uh, obviously, Frisco um, and all that's happening there is uh, uh, going to be a significant expense and will hopefully benefit PGA members and associates by virtue of a place to go for education that will be less expensive. Um, but when it's all said and done, uh, again, the restrictions are exactly the same for all 41 sections as they are for the PGA of America. Excellent. Well, this takes us right to about the nine o'clock hour. Um, if anyone on the call, Jeff or Skip or Tom, Nikki, do you have any closing comments or thoughts? I'll stay, and then I, I know that Tony's going to say a few words. Um, no, thanks, everybody. This has been this has been fun and nice, and and it's been able to it's been fun to do a little bit of research as well. So, uh, John and Eric, thanks for bringing us in to do this and Skip, thank you. Jeff, Nikki, Bryce, of course, for always producing these activities and uh, uh, we appreciate it. 
Mr. Latendre going to jump on? Well, thank you uh, very much, T.A. and uh, Jeff. Uh, before we bring in Tony, just want to ask uh, one question of uh, Jeff Johnson that's come in here. Uh, the, uh, the Monday morning quarterback, the hindsight's always 2020. In your opinion, because obviously you're very close to this all, and I, we appreciate your, your uh, being candid with this, uh, what should have happened uh, in your mind with the golf course to um, make that be a better situation for us or, or perhaps allow us to, to retain it? Or um, have you, in your mind, what should have happened with that? I, I think it should have remained a golf club. And I think a 32,000 square foot building was unnecessary uh, until such time that we could have paid for that building. Um, you know, we inherited a lot of the landmark people and their contractors and their design. Uh, that building, um, in spite of the cost, was not a properly programmed building for a clubhouse. You, you've been there, you can see that you couldn't possibly have a wedding and golfers in that one room only. Uh, it's been changed quite a bit now. Uh, the golf shop's been shrunk and there's a separate dining area so that you can do multi-functions at the same time. But had we stayed in those beautiful modular buildings, um, it, it would have been a game changer to be certain. So, if I were to do it again, uh, I, I would have stayed right where we were and working perfectly. And I think if if any of you are out there the next time you are, it's it's really a, uh, a sad tale when you stand on the ninth green of, of the Champions Golf Course, you look up to your left, there's a big lot there. That was going to be our headquarters building. As you drive in the entrance, there's a big lot to the left, which was going to be the Education Center, Library, and Hall of Fame. Um, so there were grand plans, but uh, we were premature in using our resources and not being able to ultimately complete uh, what could have been a beautiful home site for all time. I think you might be muted, John. How about now? Can you hear me? That also would have made a very short commute for uh, for Mr. Addis. Yeah, for both of us, actually. It. <laughs> yeah, I think about that every day. I drive in and drive home. Oh. Third day. <laughs> third, uh, three miles one way. I bet. I bet. So uh, that cues us into uh, Mr. Latendre, Tony. Can you uh, can you jump in and say a few words and take us out? Well, good morning and, and thanks everybody. I won't keep you long because I know we're at the end of this nine o'clock hour, but uh, just want to thank everybody that was involved. You know, Tom, Jeff, Nikki, Skip, uh, 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 Sarge, you know, Eric, John, thanks you guys for, for putting this together. I think this was a great seminar and, and a great piece for all of us. It's hard to believe that uh, our section is coming up on its centennial. You know, 1924 will celebrate 100 years and uh, hopefully we'll all be here to celebrate that together. Um, so really looking forward to that. Uh, I have to say one of the things that I encourage you all to do as you get time around the section is one of the things I'm most thankful for in my service to our, our section and especially uh, in the last two years of being the president. Uh, you know, one of the things that we get together to do every year is a, is a board planning session where we get the board of directors together with the past presidents. And I have to say how thankful I am uh, for that time with the past presidents because you get to learn about the history of our section. You get to learn about the past. And so even, uh, even if you're not serving, uh, there's past presidents all around our section and they are all involved in many different ways. Pick their brain and ask them. About our section because it really does have a story history. Southern California, believe it or not, is actually a leader among sections uh, nationally, and we're often looked to uh, and, and followed. You know, what's Southern California doing, and, and sections tend to follow. So uh, the more we continue to grow and learn and, and remember our past, the better we can be for the future. So, uh, John and everybody, thanks for putting this together. What a great topic for the catalyst. It was a great idea. Uh, glad to be a part of it this morning, and thanks for just letting me make some closing remarks. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tony, and uh, just wanted to thank the panelists as well. And uh, I just real quick, I got a chance to play golf with Sergeant uh, 
maybe five, seven years ago at a PGA event, and uh, not knowing some of this history, uh, for, for about two hours he told me this as we played, and it was pretty pretty special, and I just want to reiterate what Tony said, that we have some great uh, leaders and uh, that, that, have, uh, that are still around us, and we need to ask them the right questions and hear their stories, because like, like I said, they've done a lot of the heavy lifting that we're sure enjoying, and I just can't thank them enough. Uh, John, I want to thank you as well for the Catalyst Series this year. I know you have a few more, but as everybody knows, you're the uh, the person behind uh, this success. So thank you for this opportunity and continued success to you as well. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank yeah, Eric guys. and John, thanks for today. That was great going. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you, everybody, for putting this together. That concludes the Catalyst Webinar Series for today want to invite everybody to join us again next Thursday. We have Jim Richardson, Vice President of PGA National, who's going to be joining us and uh, encourage you all to attend. Um, everyone will receive one MSR credit for attending this morning's Catalyst. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. Stay safe and stay sane out there. We'll see you next week. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tom. Eric, thank you. Thanks, Eric.